I'm Channa Ranasinghe and I'm a chest physician and I'm going to take you through the examining of the respiratory system today. Uh, the first thing we do of course is to wash our hands and what I'm going to do after that is to introduce myself to the patient and then we'll take you through the steps of going through the respiratory examination. As you know the two most important organs in the thorax are the right lung and the left lung and I'm going to be showing you how to examine those properly. Let's go. So this is Mudita who has kindly agreed to be my volunteer and I have explained to him what we're going to do. The first thing I'm going to do is get him in the right position. I think the best way for the respiratory examination is not lying down but sat up and we'll ask him to come and the shirt and put the gala under there. The first thing we're going to do is just have a look at the patient. We're going to step back and have a look at him overall. We're going to look to see whether he is using any accessory muscles of inspiration. Let me just move this aside. Which is clearly not. The work of breathing is normal. We'll examine his respiratory rate, which should be under 14 per minute. So if you count for 15 seconds, if there are less than three or four breaths per minute, that is satisfactory. And we're going to listen to see if we can hear any breath sounds. There's no stridor, which is inspiratory, and we can hear no audible wheeze, which is usually expiratory. So the first thing we're going to do now is to examine his hands. Three things we look at at the tip of the fingers. Is there finger clubbing, which there isn't here? And remember there are five grades of clubbing from grade one which is just loss of the nail fold angle to grade five where there's expansion of the terminal digit. We look for evidence of nicotine staining on the fingers. For someone who's tar stains from having held the cigarettes in their fingers for a long period of time. And we look for evidence of peripheral cyanosis. And if there is peripheral cyanosis, you must remember to always check for central cyanosis later on. Then we look at the small muscles of the hand. Is there any wasting of the small muscles of the hand? These are all normal. Why do we do that? We know that the muscles are supplied by the T1 root, the lower branch of the brachial plexus, and any lesion in the apical region of the lung can interrupt that. These are normal. We'll then go on and look at his pulse and we want to check it for its rate primarily. I'm not going to check his blood pressure and the thing that is valuable in the respiratory exam in the blood pressure is looking for pulsus paradoxus. Pulsus paradoxus is a difficult physical sign and a sign amongst other things of acute severe asthma and there are better ways to do that but what it depends on is an exaggerated fall in the diastolic and uh, systolic blood pressure on inspiration more than 10 millimeters of mercury. So the next thing then to do is to go and have a look at his face. Let's start by looking to see if there's any anemia. One side is enough, you don't have to go down on both eyes. Then we look to see if there's any evidence of a Horner's syndrome. What are we looking for? Four signs of Horner's syndrome an indrawn eye, ptosis, closure of the palpable fissure, meiosis, look at the size of the pupil, and for loss of sweating on one side of the face. And the final thing to do is to look for central cyanosis by looking under the tongue. And that looks perfectly normal. So we've looked at the face, and now we're going to get down to the precordium, to the chest itself. So when we get to the chest itself, we're going to inspect, we're going to palpate, we're going to percuss, and then auscultate. And here you have a bit of a philosophical difficulty. Do you do each of these things at the front and then at the back? Or do you do inspection front and back, palpation front and back, and so on? I favor doing everything at the front first and everything at the back first, otherwise you look like a bit of a jack-in-the-box moving up and down front and back. But as you inspect, one very useful tip is to make sure you inspect not only at the front, 
but also at the back. Have a quick look at the back because you may find that there is a scar there or there is a plaster where there has been some aspiration done and that's a great thing to know as you proceed with your examination. So when it comes to inspecting the chest, you must look not only at the front, but you must also look from the side because remember if the patient has a barrel shaped chest like in COPD, you need to look from the front but also look at the AP diameter. So we've looked at the chest, we've inspected it, now what we're going to do is to go on and palpate. And when we come to palpate the chest, again there are four important things we must do. The first thing is to fix the position of the mediastinum. And we do that by looking to see the position of the trachea. And this can be done in two ways. One, you put your finger on the suprasternal notch centrally, you push back and see whether you directly come across the tracheal cartilages. That is one way and then you can use the finger to explore the two sides to check that they are symmetrical. The other way to do it is to put your middle finger on the suprasternal notch and then to advance the other two fingers on either side to see if the gap is the same on either side. It doesn't matter which you do, just get comfortable and practice with one of them. Now, to fix the mediastinum you need two points. The trachea, deviation to one side or the other, tends to reflect upper lobe disease, but you must also then go on and fix the position of the apex beat, which I can see here nicely in the fifth intercostal space, and that tells me that the mediastinum is in the normal position. The second thing we're going to do now on palpation is to look at expansion of the chest. And for the upper lobes, we'll do that in the anterior position. You'll put your fingers on the anterior axillary rind, the tips of your fingers gently. You'll bring your fingers, your thumbs to a pause in the midline and ask the patient to take a big breath in. And you can get a karana. And you can see very nicely that the thumbs are moving symmetrically apart. Thank you. Now, you mustn't put your thumbs on the chest because then you end up just looking at the distance between these two points. The whole point is to magnify it as much as possible by putting your hands as far apart but keeping your thumbs together. So that is the second thing on palpation. The third thing you want to do on palpation is to look for evidence of lymphadenopathy. Uh, and we will start by looking at the back of the mandible, submandibularly, looking at the two borders of the sternocleidomastoid, supraclavicularly and infraclavicularly. Once you've palpated the neck, you must then go on and look at the axilla. Remember the axilla are pyramid shaped, they have four walls and an apex. Thank you. So I'm looking at the medial wall, the anterior wall, the posterior wall, and the lateral wall. And then I'm going to go up into the apex and feel. And I tell you this from experience that in my short case at finals, the only respiratory abnormality I was expected to find was a lymph node in the axilla. Everything else was normal. So don't forget that. The final thing we must do when we palpate is vocal fremitus. And you can either put the palms of your hand on the chest or I think is better just the medial margin of the hand. And you must compare the two sides. Right. So remember that Singhala and English have a common Indo-Aryan origin and so 99 works as well as Anunamia. So that comes to the end of palpation of the chest. So when we've come to palpate the chest, we've found the position of the mediastinum. We've looked at expansion, we've looked for lymph nodes, and finally, we've looked for vocal fremitus. The next step is percussion. And percussion is quite an art. You're using the middle finger of your left hand as a sounding board, and you're using the middle finger of your right hand as the hammer. And you will find a spot here 
and you will tap and you will hear that as resonant but percussion is not only what you hear it's actually what you also feel in your finger and I had a teacher who taught us to percuss wearing our stethoscope so that we couldn't hear but we would learn to feel what dullness and resonance felt like. Now you start at the top, you go all the way down. What you will look for is evidence of liver dullness on the right hand side, which is typically found at the sixth rib level. So those last two I think you will agree are dull. Let me just take you through again. Liver's in the normal position. Um, when you are percussing the chest, remember the surface markings of the lung, the apex of the lung goes above the clavicle, so you should percuss supraclavicularly. You can use the clavicle as your sounding board to examine this part. And then you use your fingers below that. The final thing to do now is to auscultate. And for auscultation we use the diaphragm, not the bell, apart from in the apex where often you'll find that the diaphragm will not fit. So let's start at the top there. Again you can compare the two sides. First, we listen to the breath sounds themselves, and you should hear vesicular breathing, where you have a long inspiratory phase, no gap, and then a shorter expiratory phase, and those are the features of vesicular breathing. Bronchial breathing, which is a higher pitched, harsher noise, occurs over consolidation and areas of fibrosis, and there you have an inspiratory phase, a gap, and an equally long expiratory phase. That brings us to the end of the front of the chest. We must now go and do the same thing at the back. So when we approach the patient in the back, we inspect again. We've already done that briefly, and I reminded you how important that was to do early on in your examination. Then we will palpate, and by palpation, all we will do is look for expansion. The same principle, now we're looking lower down in the lungs, Good. So that's perfectly normal. So once you have looked for expansion, then you must again repeat looking for vocal fremitus. And remember that you must always look at the sides of the chest because that is where the lateral parts of the lungs are best felt and heard. We will then go on to percuss, remembering that when you examine the front of the chest you're really listening to the upper lobes, whereas at the back you're getting the middle and the lower lobes better represented. Then in the same way we will auscultate. Very important to also auscultate the lateral aspects of the chest because that is where you will hear the middle lobe and the lingula best. Good, so then just before you finish, you have another final look at the patient from the end of the bed. You must also look for evidence of ankle edema.
And if there's anything around the bed that may help you or give you a clue like a sputum pot, you must open it and examine it. So I think the only thing for me to do now is to thank Mr. for his help and um, wish you all the very best.